precious name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, James. Thank you, HBF Choir. Great singing this morning. And uh, that song was appropriate for where we're going to be this morning in our study of getting out of Egypt. And so uh, this morning, if you have your Bibles, please be turning to the book of Exodus chapter 8. And uh, we've been talking about this war for worship in, in uh, this uh, series dealing with the plagues of uh, Egypt. And, uh, and so this morning we'll be in Exodus chapter 8. If you don't have a Bible, grab one from the seat rack in front of you. And please be turning to page 93. So the last time we were here, and by the way, if you don't have a handout, just raise your hand and we will get that to you uh, over here. Just leave it up until they get around to you and they will bring that to you this morning. And so last time we were in Exodus, we saw that God hit back with the plagues and we saw plagues two and three. He sent frogs and lice because Pharaoh uh, would not play nice, right? He wouldn't play nice. So he smote him with those two plagues. And in doing so, he showed his power over the gods of of Eget, uh, the frog goddess of fertility, and Geb, uh, who's the supposed ruler of the dust of the earth. The lice was the first sign uh, that could not be emulated as the magicians had no power to turn non-organic material into organic material. And so you might think at that point Pharaoh had had enough, uh, but you know the story, right? Because we all know the story of Pharaoh, right? He had not had enough. And so today we jump back into this account, Exodus chapter 8. We're going to be picking it up in verse 20. Uh, through 32, as we once again see God give the clear commandment to let his people go. He wants them to let go. And of course, we're just saying, I surrender all. That's the last thing that Pharaoh would do is surrender, and he will not surrender. So if you have your Bible, let's look at Exodus chapter 8. Uh, let's stand with, stand with me, please. Exodus chapter 8, as we read the text this morning, we're going to start in verse 20 and read through the end of the chapter. Uh, Exodus chapter 8 and verse 20. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning, and stand before Pharaoh. Lo, he cometh forth to the water, and say to him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Else, if thou wilt not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies upon thee, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, into thy houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies, and also the ground whereupon they are. So we're not talking about a little bit of flies. We're talking swarms of flies. Verse 22, And I will never, I'm sorry, I will sever uh, in that day the land of Goshen in which my people dwell that no swarms of flies shall be there to the end that thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. And I will put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. And the Lord did so, and there came a grievous swarm of flies in the house of Pharaoh and into the servants' houses uh, into uh, all the land of Egypt. The land was corrupted by reason of the swarm of flies. Verse 25. And Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Go ye sacrifice to your God in the land. And Moses said, It is not meet so to do, for we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, and will they not stone us? We will go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go, uh, that ye may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only ye shall not go very far away and treat for me. And Moses said, Behold, I go out from thee. I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people tomorrow. But let, the, let not Pharaoh deal deceitfully any more in letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and he removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. There remained not one. And Pharaoh hardened his heart as at the time also, at this time also, I'm sorry, neither would he let the people go. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reality of your power and resurrection, your power over the earth, your power over creation, uh, Lord. And I pray, God, our hearts would not be hard this morning. They'd be soft and tender as the word of God falls upon our hearts, Lord, and our ears. Lord, I pray would wash over us like the pure water that it is, the water of your word, or that it would cleanse us, Lord, that it would keep us, Lord, that it would bring forth fruit. Lord, I pray, God, that we would learn from the lessons that uh, we see here in Exodus chapter 8 and from the hardness of Pharaoh's heart. Lord, I pray, God, it would encourage us to have a soft heart 
and to be pliable for your will. Thank you, Lord, for protecting your people and separating and sanctifying us out for your use. We praise you and ask a blessing on the reading and the hearing of your word this morning in Jesus' name. You may be seated. So we've seen that in this war for worship, uh, Pharaoh has stood off face to face now again with uh, Moses. And, and so we see that the, for his lies, he's going to get flies. And uh, he's also going to be defeating the god um, uh, Hepri, which is uh, a god that is credited with bringing the sun up every morning. Uh, of course, we know that Ra is the one that, that takes care of that. It's a, kind of a sub-god that, uh, that uh, would be at the, one of the gods that the Pharaoh would be uh, honoring when he went to the water in the morning. Uh, as now this is the second time God has commanded Moses to meet him early in the morning there along the water's bank. You know, many years ago, um, I, w I went to the YMCA to play racquetball uh, with one of my bosses, Jones Intercables, Amy's direct boss, and he was kind of like a couple of uh, tiers ahead of me. And, uh, you know, I was at probably 20 years old at the time, uh, and I was still in an okay shape. Um, and, uh, and this guy's name was Ken, so Ken Covey was his name. So we go up to the, to the YMCA, and we're playing racquetball, man. We're just, we're, you know... I'm thinking this guy, he's old. I mean, he's probably almost 40 years old, right? And so, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let him have it. And so we get out there and start playing some racquetball. And you know what? Uh, you know, wisdom does defeat age, right? So, so I had never played racquetball. Uh, and, but, of course, I'm young and I'm stupid and I think I can do anything. And so I'm out there and I'm just trying my hardest to beat Ken Covey at racquetball. If you're watching this, Ken, you know this is true. And, uh, and Ken just, he just whipped my tail perpetually. I mean... It was like not a fight. I bet the first couple serves into this thing, he's like, okay, this is, gonna, this is, this is why are we here, right? I mean, it was just bad. But I wouldn't quit, right? I, w I would not quit. I just kept going and going and going. And uh, I never got any better. I got worse and worse and worse. It's like playing golf, right? You know, you just, it just doesn't get any better. So finally, 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 I had to capitulate because I kept thinking, I'm just finally going to get this thing and then I'm going to whip him. And it never happened, Right? I was thinking about this as I read the story of Pharaoh and how he keeps uh, resisting what God is doing. I mean, this, it isn't going to get any better, Pharaoh, right? You, you can't match what God's doing. We saw last time we were in this text that they could not match the plague uh, with the lice. It was over. They were defeated. But yet we still got, we got six more plagues to go because he just won't quit. And, you know, we just sang that last song, I surrender all. That's the one thing that Pharaoh was having a hard time doing was surrendering. He didn't want to surrender. Just like I didn't want to surrender to Ken and acknowledge that this old 30-something or 40-year-old guy could whip a 20-some-year-old, 20-year-old probably, I wasn't even probably just about 20, a, a racquetball, a game which I could, had never played, right? That is arrogance and youthful stupidity, right? All wrapped into one. And, uh, and so uh, Pharaoh is full of arrogance for sure. He's probably not a youth, but he's full of arrogance and he just won't let it go. He doesn't realize that his match is over. And actually, he probably does, but he is just waiting it out as long as he can. So here's the application. Even though, uh, you know, uh, we still have six plagues left, God is already, in essence, he's done with Pharaoh. Now he's just working things to his eventual end. And, and now... Uh, he strings him along, really as an object lesson to the Jews. Uh, also, uh, for all of us, the rest of the world, for time and eternity, you're going to see the hardness of Pharaoh's heart and how the Egyptians and all the people that, that uh, are like that uh, will not win against God. Pharaoh was completely defeated by the third plague. But what was he trying to do? Hide it. He's trying to hide it. Help, hoping for that Hail Mary pass. Man, something, one of my gods will come through. He just kept trying to hide it, try to cover it, and, and it wasn't going to happen. He would not admit defeat. He wouldn't admit defeat. So I initially titled this message Lord of the Flies because this fourth sign plague is a plague of flies, as, as we've read. However, I renamed it um, Flies for Lies because of the significance of the fly in the Egyptian culture. You know, many uh, common, uh, commentators will tell you that in your Bible's wrong, and uh, they will tell you that these were not flies, these were gnats. I don't know if any of you have read that before, but they say, these are gnats. And so, you know, I can't argue that. I wasn't there. 
Um, but I do have a couple, I think, I think, really strong reasons why these were flies and not gnats. And I don't even know why people would think they were gnats, but I mean, they got reasons, but at any rate, many commentators will tell you in essence that, well, what you have in your Bible is not actually right. And by the way, when they do that, what they are telling you is that you got to believe them instead of what your Bible says. And so when God wants to use, this is why I don't think it's the word gnat. Because when God wants to use the word gnat, you know what he does? He uses the word gnat. My evidence is in Matthew chapter 23, verse 24, when Jesus says, you blind guides would strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Just for, just for such a time as this, maybe today, God put that one word in the Bible one time. Just so we could see that. He knows how to word the, use the word gnat. The word fly is used 25 times in the scripture, and it's, it's used in both the Old and the New Testament. And so um, the word flies, plural, is mentioned 10 times in eight passages. And now today we're seeing swarms of flies. Um, and so when God wants to use the word gnat, he uses it for, for that reason. I don't think the Bible stands, um, you know, Corrected. I think it is. It needs. It stands as it is, uncorrected. It's perfect. The second, and I think probably equally or more important reason I believe that it's flies and not gnats, is the significance of of the fly in Egyptian history. Uh, there's an interesting article quoting several contemporary scholars of archaeology, history, and Egyptology. Did you know you can get a degree in Egyptology? So there's a whole study. You can get a PhD, Postal Digger uh, Award, for being an Egyptologist. Um, there's this, there's this uh, lady named Tyler Woodcock, um, and, and she says that the symbolism of the fly in ancient, in ancient Egypt, and this is in her article, um, sp speaks to how significant the fly was to, as a symbol of military power. This actually isn't a very old article. This was written in 2021. Egyptian historians have found records of military generals being awarded golden flies. As long, along with lions, golden lions and axes. So, I mean, you think of lions and axes, that sounds like something you give a general. You know, like, here's a lion, here's an axe, I mean, here's your rewards. They also would give them golden flies, which to us is kind of like, man, what is that about? Uh, golden flies. But uh, they suppose that these uh, flies represented um, a persistence or a, uh, you know, a, a pestilence, so to speak, to the enemies. I'm not quite sure that's the case. I'll give you my reasons about that in just a moment. But once again, Moses would have been intimately aware of the significance of this as he was once a military uh, you know, general. He's a prince in Egypt. He would have understood the significance of these flies, especially in a war for worship. Uh, and so... Um, the author Taylor Woodcock said this, a golden fly might surprise you as a military reward, especially beside the more ferocious icon of a lion, until you consider the uh, indefatigable, I don't know how to say that, that's what it says, persistence that flies are known to exhibit. Even a single fly can feel like an unrepulsable uh, enemy, which is true. When I was a kid, I watched a cartoon of Popeye. He just tore a whole down, house down chasing one fly, you know, and he never did get there. At the end, he, he's in his hammock, everything's destroyed, and then he's got a, this fly comes and lands on his nose. I mean, just a, a testament to how the flies just are so, oh, they just, they're just hard to deal with. They're swift and persistent, and, and you won't soon forget the misfortune of getting caught in a swarm of flies, Right? So the Egyptologists suppose that many uh, necklaces of golden flies that are, are found in museums all over the world um, were worn for protection. And I think there's some truth to that. I think there's uh, some truth to the, the, what they are finding about, out about these, these objects that are uh, pretty dominant in the Egyptian culture and preserved, by the way, because they're made out of precious metals. They've been preserved for, for centuries, going back to the time of Moses. So the Bible is an accurate history book. That's news to many. Many today, if you're not in a Bible-believing church, the Bible will be approached as though it is some allegorical interpretation. Maybe it's a, a thought for thought. Uh, maybe it's the Word of God. Maybe it's just, you know, it's, it's kind of a close rendition. Uh, beloved, I believe this is the Word of God. It's accurate from cover to cover. It's an accurate history book as well. And so, 
Um, and so the Bible, um, it's going to give us information that we need to have to really understand this a little more. Archaeologists continually find the events and locations and information recorded in the scripture is accurate. I mean, I've found some fascinating articles. Just in the last few years, uh, you know, they've uncovered uh, where they believe that Samson, you know, pulled the, the temple down there at the end, and they think they found that. And all the, these things come out all the time. They don't make the news because nobody cares about the Bible, and nobody wants to support, you know, wow, guess what? All, I remember when, a few, about probably 20 years ago or 15 years ago, all the stables where the Solomon uh, had those horses. They found that. I mean, it's like every, every year, every couple of years, there's just a major archaeological find. It's like, wow, that is like exactly like the Bible said. Amazing, right? Yeah, 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 because it's an accurate book of history. So, um, so the, the archaeologists, they find these things, and, and, and eventually they'll catch up to the Bible. But one of the things that we know from Scripture is that the, the fly is important in regard to um, worship. And I'm not talking about worship of God. But it's so significant that God mentions it. But not in English. He does it in Hebrew, and it's transliterated into our English language. And some of you probably already know where I'm going with this. But if you have your Bible... Now, you don't have to turn there because I'm going to put it on the screen. But 2 Kings chapter 1, it's only mentioned in this passage in, in uh, 2 Kings. Uh, and, and it's interesting. It's the only place that we're going to talk about this particular uh, name in the Bible. But it says, Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. And if you know anything about Ahab, Ahab and Jezebel, incredible types of the Antichrist and the whorish woman of Babylon. I mean, you, you, it's just amazing, uh, just the prophetic overlay that you get there at Ahab and, and Jezebel. And so uh, Ahab, uh, not the Arab, the king of the burning sands. This is another Ahab in the Bible. Uh, <laughs> Ahab dies. And it says, And Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. And Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, uh, whether I shall recover of this disease. But the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go and meet the messenger of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, is it not because there is not a God in Israel that you go inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? God's like, why are, why are we going down to Moab and, uh, and, ta and asking about, uh, what, why are we inquiring of Beelzebub to find out what's going on among the Israelis? And so he uses this term twice, Beelzebub, Beelzebub. Now it's only mentioned a few times in the Bible. God mentions Beelzebub two more times in 2 Kings 1, 6 and verse 16. I'm not going to read them, but that is the full mention. You can find the full mention of that name right here in 1 Kings. And the reason I bring that up this morning is because it literally means Lord of the Flies. Lord of the Flies. And it's a metaphor. It's a type. It's, it's in a description of Satan. I think most of us probably already know that, right? You hear the word Beelzebub, you immediately think, Satan. Well, what does that word literally mean if you, could, if you understand it? Uh, in Hebrew, it means Lord of the Flies. And you'll notice what it says at the very beginning, Baal. And Baal worship, you'll find all over your New Testament, or you're all over your Old Testament. Because the God of Baal is, well, Satan. It's Satan worship. Baal worship is Satan worship. Beelzebub the Lord of the Flies. And there's, there's also some reasons that they would call him the Lord of the Flies. It's no accident that, that God is meeting with Pharaoh early in the morning once again to destroy any notion that Ra or Hepri, the dung beetle god that, sought, that thought to create the sun each morning or any other pagan deity, including whatever they called Beelzebub, had anything to do with having the power over Egypt. And God was saying, nope, I'm done with you, Pharaoh. I am the Lord God. You are going to let my people go. I'm going to tell you once more. Baal worship is Satan worship. And at this point in human history, if you know much about the Bible, you know, and there's prophecy in the book of, in the first uh, couple chapters of Revelation about the seat in the synagogue of Satan. Satan is always trying to emulate what God is doing, right? He always, he, he's always got a knockoff of the original thing, of the true thing. 
And so at this time in human history, I would submit to you that the seed of Satan would certainly be Pharaoh. Just like in the time of Paul, the seed of Satan would have been Nero, right? And, and, we, can, you know, and we know now that that is found in Rome based on what uh, we know from the prophecies of Scripture. Okay, so we just talked about that last Wednesday night at Bible study. So here we have Pharaoh's throne, and, and that leads us to an exposition this morning. Because like Satan... Pharaoh will not yield to God's authority and will, and it appears um, that even when he does, he's doing it with deception. For he is simply buying time for more deception as he postpones the, uh, and delays his ultimate demise and destruction. There are several lessons that we can learn about our adversary as God gives him flies for lies. Gives him flies for lies. Why? Because he's saying, oh, I'll work with you. I'll work with you. And what's he keep doing? Going back on it. He says, okay. Okay, Pharaoh. I'm going to give you some flies for your lies. So the first thing we see in our study this morning is Pharaoh, like Satan, is defeated. I've already mentioned that. He's defeated. In Exodus 8, verse 20, again in our text, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. We are told literally in the book of Ephesians chapter 6 that we're in a spiritual warfare. What is it that we're supposed to do? Stand ye therefore. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. So what does he tell uh, Moses to do? Hey go stand before Pharaoh. Go stand there before Pharaoh. And then he goes on to say uh, uh, he goes on to say, Lo, he cometh forth to the water, and saying to him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Else if thou wilt not let my people go, I will uh, send swarms of flies upon thee, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, into thy houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies, and also the ground wherein they are. So they're everywhere. The ground, their property, the people. And I will sever in that day the land of Goshen. Now here's the big miracle. I'm going to sever the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. He's like, Pharaoh, I'm going to come after this thing with flies, and I'm going to separate out Goshen, and that's where my people are, and, and I'm going to show you how powerful I am. Because even if your magicians could make more flies, they're just going to multiply on top of you. Because they're not going to Goshen. He's, he's, he, there's nothing that he can do at this point to save face. Pharaoh is, is undone. He's defeated, but he still won't surrender. He won't surrender all. He won't surrender anything. So this confrontation marks a shift in the way God is dealing with Pharaoh. He is repeating the same command. Let my people go now for the fourth time. Uh, this time he says that, that, he, that, he may, that my people may serve me. God has put Pharaoh in a place and he is not, that he is not a God uh, that he can demand worship of Abraham's seed. At this point, his ability to affect God's people has ended. God is like, that's over. I'm protecting my people. The first three plagues, as far as we know, they were inflict, afflicted just like the, the Egyptians were afflicted. We're not told they weren't. Here we are clearly told that they are being separated out. They're being called out. And uh, they're not actually being, they are called out. But they're being set apart by God so that they are not afflicted by these swarms of flies. And the, this warning of sending swarms of flies impacts Pharaoh in the following ways. In verse 21, he sends these flies upon, upon thee. So it's very personal. He's like, hey, you're going to get these flies, and they're coming to you, pal. You're not going to hide in your house and get away from this like we talked about the first plague, right? When it didn't work out well, he just went to his house, and he still had water, right? They dug wells. They brought water. The first person in the kingdom to get water was him. He wasn't affected. But we saw that next plague. That lice, it was up all on him. It was in his bed. It was in his bed chamber. God made sure to let him know, this is personal. Well, guess what? These flies are personal, too. Right? It's like the United States back years ago when they wanted Gaddafi blew down a, a, a jet or something, supposedly Pan Am jet. All of a sudden, they're like, hey, we're coming after you. They start bombing his house. You know, it's personal. This war's getting personal. And so, God is sending the swarms of flies to him. And, I'll, and then he says, I'm going to send them upon your servants. And this will damage your image as, God, as a God among those in your court and among your countrymen, those that serve you. Your profession of faith 
is destroyed, Pharaoh. Everybody's going to know you're undone. You can't keep these flies off of them. And I'm going to send swarms upon thy people. Politically, you're going to lose here, Pharaoh. Your clout is going nowhere because they're going to see you have no answers. And I'm going to send swarms upon your houses. All your property will be impacted, but not just your houses, all the people's houses, all the Egyptian, all the people of Egypt, except the Jews in Goshen, are going to be infested with these swarms of flies. But God promises to protect his people in Goshen. Now, Goshen is uh, believed to be in Lower Egypt, which when you think of that Lower Egypt, we often look at a map and think, oh, it's south, right? Kind of toward uh, the south part of uh, the, the Nile. But it's actually, the lower part is, is up by where we would commonly call the Nile Delta, like Alexandria and all of those areas. That's where they believe that Goshen was. And so God is specific in teaching Pharaoh the lesson that he is uh, Lord in the midst of the earth, he says specifically. I am Lord in the midst of the earth. Now he's Lord of heaven and the Lord of earth, but he's letting them know I'm controlling this planet. God is being specific with his words here in the midst of the earth. And he means he is the God that controls the earth. Not the gods of the Egyptian pantheon. Ra, Horus, Isis, um, Happy, Hecate, Geb, Epri. None of these gods have any power over the planet. The God does not just totally obliterate. And he shows himself stronger than those Egyptian gods. Including Pharaoh who would consider himself to be a god. So the application here is that Pharaoh's life then is in the Lord's hands. Right? His very life is in the Lord's hands. Well, we'd say, well, no, duh. Right? But you know what's interesting about all of this? Is there are people today who live their life and they just take everything into their own hands. And they act like they're a God. And I think we all understand how that goes. We all have a little bit of that in us, if not a lot. Where we make our own decisions, we do our own thing, we control our own lives, or so we think we do. And then the older you get, the more you realize, guess what? I don't have control of nothing. Life has a funny way of teaching you that. And that's probably why we all came to the house of worship this morning, right? I mean, uh, I, that's why I'm here. This isn't my message. This is God's message. This isn't my Bible. This is God's Bible. Now, it is my Bible and it is my message because I'm taking it on. But it's God's Word, right? It's, His Word is true. And we understand that He is the one that, that ultimately controls everything, including our eternal life. So we come to Him and we cast our care upon Him, something that, that not only Pharaoh isn't willing to do, but there's many today in our culture who will not do that. They will not acknowledge there is a God that's bigger than them or their toys or their agenda or their education or their economy or whatever it is. And they want to they wanna control their circumstances without acknowledging the God of the universe who is, by the way, Jesus Christ. So Pharaoh's life is in the Lord's hands, but he won't acknowledge that. He's still acting large and in charge, like he's got this under control. And, and then that's what we do. People fake it till they make it, but they never make it. And so they too will one day, these that want to rule their own life without acknowledging God, will come to the realization that they are not a God and that they still must answer to the Creator. And as we read this text, you can see how gracious God is. I mean, Moses is. They're, they're, they're really being gracious. They could just obliterate Pharaoh and Egypt and just call it good. And God has done that, right? He did that in Sodom. He finally had enough. He said, that's it. We're done. We're not playing. But here he's going on and he's making an object lesson because we all need to understand these things. God is, is, is segregating and sanctifying his people in the midst of Egypt. Now I say the word segregating. I know that scares some people, but... Biblically, that's what's going on. In Exodus 8.22, he's, he's separating his people out from the world. This is the first plague that does not impact the children of Israel as God provides divine protection for his son, Israel, right? We saw early on in the text in Exodus chapter... Um, uh, I wrote Exodus 4.21. Now I'm second guessing because I forgot to look it up. And I was wrong. Exodus 4.23... Exodus 4.23, the Bible tells us that Israel is God's son. Exodus 4.23. And he's protecting Israel as he does his son from the oppression of the Egyptian power there coming from Pharaoh. So this plague is not going to impact his son. 
Israel. We saw in Exodus chapter 4 and verse, 20, and verse 23 that he is the son. Now we also saw that prophecy when Jesus was born and needed protection from Herod. God took him to Egypt and protected his son from being murdered by Herod. Interesting things that are in the Bible. And so um, it's also interesting to me as I looked at this that Israel tasted 30% uh, of the plagues of Egypt. But they, were, they didn't have to deal with the other 70%. Uh, directly. Uh, and in the coming tribulation, God will allow judgment to fall upon Israel so that he can redeem a remnant and fulfill his covenant with Israel. But the remaining judgment that's coming to this planet is for this world. When the time you get to those vile judgments, everybody's going to get a big dose of that. So the first thing that we see here, just clearly, that Pharaoh's defeated. Uh, just like Satan, he's a defeated foe, but he's still like a serpent that's had his head crushed. He's still flailing about, waving his body around, trying to Trying to, uh, you know, trying to cause as much havoc as he can. The second thing we see is Pharaoh is like uh, Satan in that he is in denial of the division of God's people. Now, when we say division of God's people, sometimes we're like, oh man, that's a bad thing. This is not division of the people, but division, a separation, a setting apart. And it, the word is divide because that's what God uses in verse 23. I will put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow shall be this sign, or shall this sign be. And the Lord did so, and there came a grievous swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh, that's where it started, and into his servants' houses. It went to the houses there, and then all the land of Egypt. And the land was corrupted by reason of the swarm of flies. So it started at, at Pharaoh's house. So everybody in Egypt knew this started over there at Pharaoh's house, and we're all getting a dose of it. Why? Because he's dealing with the Lord, uh, the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Moses and Aaron. This God is, if Ra's the sun god and, and Pharaoh's his son, it isn't working very well for us here in Egypt. And so even, in Pharaoh's, even, even if Pharaoh's magicians could multiply more flies, it wasn't going to touch Israel. And the, and the beautiful picture here for us is that, uh, that of our eternal security. It's often said that we are in this world, but we're not of the world. Isn't that true? Right? We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Israel is a son, and of course we are, 1 John chapter 3 says, we are the sons of God. We've been born again. So we have this promise that, that because we've been born again, not only do we get eternal life, but literally there's nothing in this life that can touch us. Now things touch us, right? we get, we're afflicted with our endemic nature, but the day that we got saved, we've already overcome. So for me, March 25th, 1987, eternity began for me. Now I have a season in eternity where I'm in this old carcass. And this carcass is going to port me around here so I can do the Lord's business as an ambassador of Christ. But there's coming a day where I get out of this carcass, I get a glorified body, and I'm moving on with eternity future. Literally, there's nothing in this life that really can touch us. Not even death. And you say, well... Really? Yeah, really. That's what Romans chapter 8 says in verse 35. And who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Nope. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. But don't mourn, for we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Even if you die... Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We are so saved that even if somebody walked in here and shot me while I'm preaching, I'm coming back. I mean, I'm better than Freddy Krueger, man. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's an it's a, it's a eternal sequel. You're not getting rid of us once you get saved. I mean, there is no stopping the love of Christ. His salvation is so secure that, man, even if you drop dead and you're six feet under, you're coming back. If you know Jesus as Lord and Savior, if you're his son, if you're a child of God, if you've been born again. Nay, and all these things are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Why are we more than conquerors? Because we are part of the ownership. We don't, Jesus is not, God is not telling Pharaoh, I'm going to whip your tail. He's telling Pharaoh, I'm Lord. I'm creator. You cannot create dirt. I'm the one that created this. And beloved, if you're born again, you are of the seed of the creator. It's amazing the love that God has bestowed upon us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Paul went all the way 
to Nero to prove that. I mean, he stood just like Moses at the seat of Satan, went face to face, got killed for it, and he's coming back with us, by the way. We're coming back with him and Jesus Christ to deal with Rome later. I'm just telling you guys, there's no stopping God. This, this also represents a type of the benefits of our sanctification in Christ, right? Because at the Passover, Israel will be literally pulled out of Egypt. They will be free from Egypt completely as they go into the wilderness and eventually into the promised land. But here we see that Israel is sanctified in Egypt. That's ex exceedingly important to us today, right? They're not just sanctified from Egypt. They will be at the Passover, Right? Once the Passover is offered, God will get them through the Red Sea. They will be sanctified. Front. They won't even have anything to do with Egypt. They don't have to have anything to do with them again unless they choose to, which Israel, the, the ten tribes of the north did, and it bit them. But at the end of the day, they are not even, they're not bound by Egypt after the Passover. But here they're, they're still stuck. They're not free yet to leave, leave Egypt, just like you're not yet free to leave here because of this carcass. I can't just like shoot to the third heaven today. Well, I can in my prayers, but like physically, I'm not able to get there unless all I can do is communicate to the third heaven. But and even though I'm seated together in heavenly places in Christ, I know it's kind of kind of confusing. But yet right now, you know, physically, I'm kind of bound, just like you are, into these bodies. You're stuck here on earth. And while you're stuck here on earth, you know what we need to be? We need to be set apart. We need to be sanctified for God's use. So they didn't have to leave Egypt to be set apart. Now we know why, I've already told you in previous messages, why it was important that they face some of the plagues because they were taking a little bit of their own medicine. Ezekiel tells us that they were worshiping the gods of Egypt. So God was working that out and he was showing them, when you follow me, it's going to go good for you down here in Goshen. You follow Egypt, you're going to be loaded up with plagues. It doesn't have, don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. Peter said this in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. He says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. And they're talking about Cass County now. That ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which is in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, uh, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. He says, hey, listen, make sure that you live like you're in Goshen. His people, he's like, are going to be set apart. Why? They're different. The, the, Moses points that out here in just a few minutes, why they're different. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 15 says, For so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, not using your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness, but as servants of God. You are free. We're free men. That's one of the problems that, that, that literally, like today, in, the, in culture, is a problem, because Christians intuitively understand that they are free. The concept of liberty and justice for all. Where does that come from? The Bible. Why is that, why is that prevalent, in, or was prevalent in the United States? Because of Christianity. And that was worked out. Uh, and that's, that was the whole premise of our, the Revolutionary War. Was there wasn't, there wasn't justice going on. So they decided that we're going to trust God to start a new union here. We'll see how it goes. Because the king isn't, he's, he's a... Anyway, by the way, would anybody want to be under King Charles? Good night, man. That was a good call to get out from underneath that stuff. But the point is this. We're under God. We used to, you know, that's, that's basically the concept. Now, that's a Christian concept. This is the same God we're talking about. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not Beelzebub, the Lord of the flies. Right? That winged serpent that is able to control hordes, a third of the angels under him and devils. Right? We're not serving that God. We're serving the one true God. And by the way, if you do the math, that means two-thirds. We're, we're twice as strong as him. Even though he's, he shouldn't be messed with because he's he's serious foe. There's some practical benefits of being sanctified in Egypt. Now, not by Egypt, but while you're in the world, not being of the world. You guys tracking with me what I'm saying here? I don't want to confuse anybody. There's some practical benefits to being born again. 
having your Bible and loving the Word of God, to having the Spirit of God in you and being part of a local New Testament church. That's how we are set apart from this world. It's what we're doing here. It's what you're doing in your daily devotions. It is what the Spirit of God is doing in your life daily. That sets you apart from the world. It makes you different because you don't have the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind because you walk in the Spirit and not the flesh, right? You have a different conversation, the Bible calls it, a different lifestyle of which sometimes people will might make fun of you or mock you or, or, or call you a teetotaler, of which I have co totally embraced. And all of those things. The reality is this. Man, you're living in Goshen. And don't let that stuff bother you. Be thankful. Wear it as a badge of honor. Like when I first got saved and they started calling me Jesus in high school, right? Because I was preaching all the time, you know? It's like, hey, if you want to call me Jesus, I cannot think of a better compliment. Thank you very much. And of course, they were, they were teasing me, but I was like, that's cool. I'd rather be Jesus than Beelzebub. So there's some practical benefits to being sanctified while you're here. Not to mention your inheritance that you'll get in eternity, but, but just practically speaking, there's some bennies. There's no consequences for the judgment that is coming upon those who live in the land, in this world, in Egypt. We live in this world, and, and we are... In, now, by the way, there is consequences, like, like uh, Jeremiah had to deal with the consequences upon Israel. But God protected him through all that. God will protect you and keep you. But we live in this world and are impacted by the things that go on, yet we're not touched with the same plagues when we live in a sanctified manner. I have probably had more, you know, passive smoke than many of you in my lungs over the years and growing up with secondhand smoke. But by God's grace, um, you know, I'm not burning out my lungs every day with cigarettes, pot smoke, or chemically charged water, right? So what is that? I, I'm, I'm, I'm delivered from that to some degree. But you don't have to worry about, like, I don't have to worry about because I got a new spirit, I don't have to worry about pickling my liver and getting cirrhosis of the liver. Now, that doesn't mean I couldn't get non-alcoholic cirrhosis. I mean, I'm living in an endemic body. But you see what I'm saying? There's benefits to being set apart, to laying down stuff that God tells you to lay down and, and embracing the spirit of God and the fullness of who God is and being everything God wants you to be, not for the army, but for Jesus. I don't have to worry about, uh, about some of these things. I don't have to worry about uh, dying from a, uh, the use of recreational drugs and, and, you know, getting something I bought illicitly laced with fentanyl and, and dropping out dead somewhere. I'm just, that's just one of the benefits of being set apart for God's use. It's a benefit of being in Goshen. I mean, I live in the world. I, I live in the world. I know what goes on in the world. But I'm just saying, uh, by God's grace, if I continue in the path I'm on, I don't think that's probably something I'm going to have to deal with. But my heart breaks for those that do. I'm not making fun of that. I don't say I'm better than that. I'm just saying, but when you get saved, God changes you. He gives you a different lifestyle, a different conversation, a whole different, uh, different set of, of, of things that you're interested in and doing, and he takes those things away, and, and he leaves them in Egypt while you're living in Goshen. There's just some benefits to that. I'm not filled with anxiety about what tomorrow will bring because I know God will supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. But yeah, I gotta sweat the bills like you do. Yeah, I gotta make sure the bills get met. I know there's problems, but you know what? As a, when you're living in Goshen, it's just not the same as when you live in Egypt. Man, when you're all caught up in all the, the burdens of Egypt, man, you're just in bondage to sin. You're in bondage to the, to the society. You're in bondage to all these things. But something happens when you get saved, and it's from the inside out. You become a free man. And you preach this gospel of freedom, freedom in Christ, freedom. Liberty that comes through Jesus Christ. And man, it is not just, it's not just like, uh, it's tangible. And when the judgments of this life come, and you've been married to one man or one woman your whole life, and, and you've, been, you've been faithful to your marriage vows, you're not worried about AIDS coming to get you. Because you just, you've been set apart in Goshen. While you were in Egypt, God puts you in a place that benefits you. It's a place that's limited, though, when it comes to worship. We've got brothers right now struggling. They live in Goshen, man, but Pharaoh's telling them, you cannot worship the way you want to worship. Some of them have to die to get to the throne of heaven and freely worship. I'm talking within the last few months. 
some of our brothers in India dropping dead. Not dropping dead, they're getting killed because it's hostile down here in Egypt. It's, if you don't know there's a war for worship, you would have been asleep. And if you don't actually realize that the people on the front lines of that war are you and me, you're really asleep. And if you don't really realize that there are principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places that want to put a stop to who you are and what you believe, you better wake up. And you better look for your, look for your deliverer who's on high. Because there ain't going to be any, there's nobody down here on the world level that's not a Christian that's wanting to help you. Your deliverance, your help comes from the Lord. And guess what? He's well able. He's well able to overcome. He's been doing that for 2,000 plus years in his church. So God is using Pharaoh's hardness to give Israel a new identity. This is what's good about this. He now separates them out. He divides them from the Egyptians. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't you know that, Corinthians? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners. It sounds like America. Shall inherit the kingdom of God. Or at least what you're, you're told is America. And such, now listen, were some of you. That's not who you are. That's not your identity. If you're born again, Paul's telling that to some carnal folks in the church. He says, that's not your identity. That's who you were. Come up on out of that thing, he says. And such were some of you, but ye are. This is who you are. You are washed. Ye are sanctified. You're set apart. Right now, right now you are washed. Right now you are sanctified. Right now you're set apart. Ye are justified, just as if you've never sinned. In the name of of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God because Jesus Christ died on the cross and because He put His Spirit inside of you when God looks at you you are justified you are sanctified you are washed seize that identity while you live in Egypt that's what He's telling the Corinthians all things are lawful unto me but not all things are expedient all things are lawful for me but I will not be brought under the power of any what are we seeing here in this story of Pharaoh and Moses and Israel and the Egyptians? What we're seeing is a power struggle. Amen. What do you see in the culture today? Not just in America, all over the planet. Yeah, you see it because we know what time it is. I used to have a watch there. Now I have to look here, which says red, 16 <laughs> seconds over. So I got to hurry up. All right, so. <laughs> Oppression. And persecution should not highlight or, uh, our distinction from the world. When things don't go our way, Christians don't, we just don't burn down other people's property. That's just not who we are. We don't riot and carry on. We trust and obey because, listen, there's no other way. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. We are completely different. That doesn't mean we're passive altogether. It doesn't mean as much as life in us, right? We live peaceably with all men. Our first priority is peace. It doesn't mean, though, that we're completely passive. We're different. We're separated out. We've been divided from this world by a sharp two-edged sword. In Romans chapter 12, Paul went on later to say, If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. Give God the opportunity to answer. I will repay, saith the Lord. Just trust me on this. My time of wrath is coming. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. That is the testimony that the church should have. There is a very important theological point found in the dis division of Israel from the Egyptians. The first of six mentions of the word division in the Bible is found in our text. The second is found in 2 Chronicles 32, 5, where God is dividing up the 12 tribes for worship. And the last four are mentioned in the Gospels when the Jews were divided because of the preaching of Jesus. In, in Luke 12, 51, uh, the text says, Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth, I tell you, nay, but rather division. That's what Jesus said. John 7, 43. So there was division among the people because of him. 
because of him. John 9, 16, therefore said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was division among them. John chapter 10 and verse 19, there was a division therefore among the Jews because of these sayings. What divided them? The words of God. In Genesis 1-4, it's the first time we see the word divided in the Bible. And what did God divide? You guys know. The light from the darkness. He did that by speaking his words. The Bible tells us that God is light and in him is no darkness at all in 1 John 1, 5. And then later in Hebrews chapter 4, the Bible tells us for the word of God is quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints of marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It goes on to say, neither is, there any other cre neither is there any creature that is not made manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Right? So Hebrews tells us that we are dealing with a sharp, two-edged sword. And you know what? It forces a decision. It forces a division. Why? Because you're either going to serve God or you're not. And this life is about making that big choice, that big decision. And when God divided out Israel from Egypt, he was exposing the sin at the, at the heart of the Egyptian system. On, in, on Sinai, God will give the first commandment to Israel. He will tell them, Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. There's only one God to worship, and it is, it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. And God has given us a sharp two-edged sword, this Bible. And when it is preached, it pierces the, to the heart of the matter, and it exposes us, just like it's exposing Pharaoh as a fraud to this whole people. Why? Because the words of God have gone out, and he is bringing judgment upon the heart of Pharaoh and the Egyptian people. When we receive the gospel, we're spiritually circumcised. Just as the Jews were physically circumcised. What made them different? They were circumcised. They were supposed to be. They'll get to that later. We remember how Moses had to circumcise his son and God was about to kill him. Why? Because God's like, hey, you're going to be a peculiar people. You're going to be different. What makes us different is, is when we get saved. A people who are not a people become a people. We get cut, our, our souls get cut away from our flesh. We become circumcised spiritually. That's what the New Testament teaches. We get cut away from our flesh. That's why you have, a dual you have a dynamic dual nature, right? Your flesh is like, I want this. And then your spirit's like, nope. I want, we needed that. That's why we've got to feed our spirit. We talk about that in D1. The Word of God is our source of nourishment. It's our source of strength. What the world hears as judgment and judgmental speech is the, oftentimes to us saving grace. Don't call me a sinner! Man, thank God I learned I was a sinner. Don't tell me I need to be saved. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. You're my redeemer. I mean, it's just, and if you've been lost, you know how it was when you're lost. Your mind is separated from what, the right thinking, man. You're just 180 degrees opposite. It takes, it takes the Spirit of God to change our minds. What the world hears is judgment and judgmental speech, speech we find is saving grace. We were sinners, but now we're saints. We were lost, but now we're found. We were blind, but now we see. We were lame, but now we walk. And by God's grace, we walk in wisdom toward those that are without. Redeeming the time, because the days are wicked. The last thing we must, uh, that must be mentioned about the subject of being divided is the biblical reality that there are only three people groups in the, in the world and this is really an important piece of that right here in Exodus chapter 8 in this particular plague. Because God is about really manifesting that. To this point, it hasn't become known among the Gentile world that there is a nation called Israel. Why? Because that's all been in promise from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, down through Joseph and now to Moses. And it's, we read it in retrospect and we go, well, yeah, that's the nation of Israel. But to this point, there hasn't been a show-off with another nation. And this nation that God is choosing happens to be the strongest nation on the planet at that time. And what is he doing in the midst of that? He is bringing out, a Goshen, out of Goshen a new people, a new nation. He's birthing a nation. And where that will take us theologically is the three people groups. The first two are is what we call the Jews and the Gentiles. And in the Old Testament, that's all you had was the Jews and the Gentiles. You were either Jewish and in the promise of, and, and holding on the promises of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you were either born Jewish or you became like Ruth and were a proselyte Jew and got in on those covenant promises with Israel. Or you were a Gentile. Didn't matter if you were red and yellow, black and white. If you weren't Jewish, you were a Gentile. That makes it a lot simpler, doesn't it? We need to go back to that thinking. 
But then there's a third group. What's the third group? The church. And you guys are listening. You're going to school here at Heartland. That's good. Right now there's three people groups. So you got a kingdom of this world, right? That's the Gentile kingdoms. They're right, fighting over to this day. You got the kingdom of heaven. Eventually Israel's going to run and get those Abrahamic promises. They're going to get to rule and reign just like God promised them. But then you got this spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of God. And guess who gets that? That's the church. It's spiritual. Now I'm looking forward to that. Well, already got it. We're, all, we're just proclaiming it. We're like Moses and Aaron. That's why we're priests and kings. Beloved, there's just a lot, there's a lot in this book. You just got to believe it. You got to really take it seriously. Because it's all right here. Thirdly, and I got to move quickly. Pharaoh's defeated. He's in denial, but he's also delusional. Verses 25 through 27, And Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Go ye sacrifice to your gods in the land. And Moses said, It's not meet to do so. For we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes? And will they not stone us? I mean, wh what are you talking about? Stay here and, 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 and worship. What are you talking about, Pharaoh? We will go three days journey in the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us. Pharaoh, we're going to do what God said because we can't worship here like God wants us to worship. we got to get out of this place. <coughs> Pharaoh calls uh, Moses to do this. The same thing that the devil is going to cause you to do. Or not cause you, but call you to do. I can promise you this. If you're going anywhere with God, if you're getting traction with Jesus, you know what, God, what the devil will do? Once he realizes he can't stop you, so he'll want you to compromise. He's calling Moses to compromise. Well, just that, okay, don't go so far. Just stay. I'll tell you what. We'll just, since God set apart Goshen, why don't you guys just stay right there and you can just sacrifice right there. You can just worship right there. And I will save face and you guys will worship. Can't we come to a deal? Well, Moses wasn't born yesterday. He's like, no, we cannot. God has called us to go and that's what we need to do. We need to go out and we need to worship. And by the way, Moses or Pharaoh knows he's powerless to do anything. Once the world realizes they can't beat you, you know what? They'll command you to join them. How many have been at work? That's happened. Oh, come on, man. Come on, man. Now they know your testimony. They know they're not going to, but you know what? They want you to come with them. And there's times you just got to say, no, God's not calling me to go that way. Thanks for no thanks. As you were, I'm fine. You, if you need me, I'll be over here. Moses is not about to exchange the Lord for Pharaoh. When Pharaoh calls Moses to go, Moses says no. Pharaoh says go in, in, in partial obedience. Moses says no. The world will call you to compromise. And when, when I first got saved, I can remember people saying, Hey, Brian, man, I am glad you got saved. But just make sure you don't get too radical. Don't get too, too zealous about this thing. Too late. I already drank the Kool-Aid. So, I mean, Jesus is all in for me. I'm going all in for him. Moses reminds Pharaoh why they must leave Egypt to worship the Lord. All of, of all the images, corruptible men of birds and beasts and creeping things that the Egyptians worship, Moses points out the one thing that they sacrifice, that they use in their worship service, that God has established in the Hebrew line, is the one thing... Oh, this is such an important point. That's an abomination for the Egyptians. He's like, Pharaoh, this doesn't even make sense. You know that we worship with the very thing that you find abominable. I mean, you got the dung beetle you'll worship. Uh, you got the, the, the falcon you'll worship. You got the, this thing you worship, these half-hybrid demonic beings that you'll worship. You know, half head of a falcon. Half, you got the cobra head over here. And you got all these freaky... A hybrid demonic things that you're worshiping, but the one thing that we actually use in our worship, you find to be abomination. We can't do that. They'll be stoning us. That's how bad they view our symbol of worship. I mean, it's such a hideous sight. What might that be? Sheep. Sheep. They hated the sheep. 
Oh, because those sheep with big fangs? I mean, I don't know. I mean, the sheep are slithering around on the floor? Oh, no, we can handle that. We can handle everything, but we can't handle the sheep. And we hate the shepherds. We don't like sheep and we don't like shepherds in Egypt. We hate them. We'll stone them if they start worshiping in front of us. Beloved, what do you think the world thinks about worshiping Jesus? Hey, and I know, I was on this, I've been on both sides of this, man. I know what I thought. There's a part of you that hates it because it exposes your sin and your separation from a holy God. And whether you'll admit it or not, you know it's true. I knew it was true. I didn't know how to articulate it. I wanted it not to be true, but it was true. I was lost. And when I would see Christians do what they do and they love God and they love people, it convicted my heart because they had something I didn't. And they were sheep led by a chief shepherd. Beloved, the world can't get their head around that thing. And and Moses is saying, listen, you know this, Pharaoh. They hate us down here. Pharaoh calls Moses to this compromise and he's like, no. Have you ever noticed how Christians are the only people group that magnify the power of the Lamb? There's a reason. To this day, the world hates the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world because from Genesis 3, the sacrifice of a Lamb reminds us of our need to have our sin covered by the blood. Whether the Egyptians understood it or not, they hated the shepherds and the sheep. Genesis 43, 32 said this. And they set uh, on him for by... They set on him... uh, uh, Let me back up. And they set on for him by himself and for them by themselves and, and the Egyptians, which did eat with him by themselves, because the Egyptians might not eat bread with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Now that actually, that verse I just read to you is dealing with Joseph, who was a Hebrew, eating with Egyptians. But they had separated him out because they they had him at high esteem because he'd saved their nation. While his brothers were over here and segregated, divided, because the Egyptians didn't eat with shepherds. They were a lower class, lower caste. Remember what they said to Jesus? Man, why is he eating with sinners? Because he's going to save them and turn them into sheep. Genesis 48, 33, And it shall come to pass when Pharaoh shall call you, and shall, what shall you say? What is your occupation? They, uh, that ye shall say, Thy servant's trade hath been about cattle from our youth even till now, both we and our fathers, that ye may dwell in the land of Goshen. For every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Early on, Joseph was like, hey guys, you don't want to hang out with the Egyptians. You need to go to Goshen land. Try to get away from these guys because they hate you. Even though a shepherd boy turned slave, turned second in command to Pharaoh, was the savior of the Egyptian nation. They hated, they hated the shepherd and the sheep. What a, ha- what a picture of how many of you the sacrifice of the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. You roll up onto Islam and you say, listen, Jesus Christ is not a God. He is the one true God. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. You go to Jerusalem today and you tell the Jews, Jesus Christ is your Messiah. He is Jewish all the way. He's the fulfillment of your prophecies. It's in there from Genesis Forget the revelation because you don't believe that yet. But it is there all the way through the Old Testament, through the five books of the law, through the whole Torah. He is there. They're going to say, some of them will. Some of them will just say, away with you. Man, guys, God is gracious with us, isn't he? There's a reason John the Baptist announced Jesus as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, as it is written. For thy sake we are killed all the day long. He's worth our best sacrifice. But you know what, God? Some of you might be worried, like, man, do I got to go out and die? Like, is this a Jim Jones message or something? No, it is not. Because what God is is asking us to do is not die, because we can't. He's asking us to live. He's asking us to live. 1 Corinthians, or Romans chapter 12, you know this. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies, sheep, a living sacrifice, 
holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. Don't be like the Egyptians, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. All things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. Choose what's best in Goshen. Renew your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. This is why you cannot worship God half-heartedly. It's got to be all in. We must go all in or we'll be facing the plagues of this planet. And many of us know that, right? You want to live like the world? You'll reap what the world reaps, even as a Christian. Just look at the divorce rate. I saw a meme yesterday, the Bible Belt, and all these statistics. All, all the world statistics, divorce, drug addiction, whatever, blah, blah, blah. It's the same in the Bible Belt as it is everywhere else. Why? Because we don't always like to renew our mind and worship like we ought. Lastly, we're done. Pharaoh, like Satan, is deceitful in attempting to manipulate God's character for his gain. The last few verses, 20 through 32, Pharaoh comes and he says, I'll let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only ye shall not go very far. Entreat for me. Would you just pray for me? Please get these flies out of here. Moses this time doesn't say, well, let me honor you. What time would you like those to leave? It's like, now, please. And Moses is gracious. He doesn't argue. He doesn't, he doesn't debate him any further. He says, Behold, I go out from thee, and I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, from his people tomorrow. That's the timeline. But let not Pharaoh deal deceitfully anymore in letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. Pharaoh, have you learned your lesson? Don't, don't, don't mess with us. Of course, we know he hasn't, but Moses is giving an opportunity to repent. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and he removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. And there remained not one, not one. That's as big of a miracle as bringing the swarms of flies. If you ever had a fly, try to multiply in your presence, man. It's hard to stop them. It's like, come winter, come quickly winter. I want to kill these things. Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also. Neither would he let his people go. Pharaoh capitulated. But he wasn't contrite, right? His heart really wasn't in it. He was going along to get along. Moses honored his word because he's not like Pharaoh. Beloved, we're not like Pharaoh. You're like Moses. You're like Aaron. The flies are gone. And the scripture is clear that there is just one remaining. There's not one remaining, I should say, rather. And Pharaoh, well, he humbled himself and found redemption and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. No, he didn't. He hardened his heart once again. So here, let me conclude with this. The consequences of hardening heart, as we saw last time, is getting an even harder heart. But we, receive, but we rejoice because sin has been defeated so we can be divided from Satan's influence in our lives and serve and worship the Lord Jesus Christ because we are sheep led by the chief shepherd. And if you're here this morning and you think you can find eternal life through some other way than Jesus Christ, like Pharaoh, you are delusional. You are denying what the Bible says. And, and I'll tell you what, at the end of the day, the person that's being deceived is you. I don't know if I'm talking to anyone in this room or not, or someone out in the stratosphere, but the person that's being deceived is you. God's not the way, the truth, and the life because I get up here and rant about it. God is the way, the truth, and the life because Jesus Christ is everyone, everything he said he was and he fulfilled the whole law. And he died on the cross in our place and he rose again the third day and he's alive right now. And in a time when people will believe in the spirit of the air, the spirit of the tree, the spirit of the earth, they have a hard time believing in the spirit of the one true God, the Lord Jesus Christ and his Holy Ghost that is convicting their very heart like a sword piercing a thunder trying to divide them from this world so they can be separated and brought into the bride of Christ. But you know what? Not everybody has a hard heart, and God is gracious and merciful. And right now is a time where God is calling all men everywhere to repent. And so if you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, this is a great time to soften the heart and to receive Jesus. This has kind of been a hard message, and it's not a real lovey-dovey, Laodicean-style message. But you know what? It, sometimes it's a message someone needs to hear. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, as we conclude, the Bible tells us in Philippians that every knee should bow and every tongue should confess. Like the Philippian jailer who took him and his house and they all got saved at the preaching of Paul and Silas. It was glorious.
Paul later would go on and write in Romans chapter 14 that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And Lord, this morning, as we know Pharaoh did not do that, 